Time once again for the Real People Multi-Game Solitaire Mega Tournament. Since it's Thursday, I thought it'd be a good time uh, to kind of just get an overview of the players and how they're doing and what the prospects are and how uh, who they're competing with for what and for why and all that. So let's start with our score leader, which is Runt here. Runt has been our leader for many, many turns now. I haven't kept track. I don't even know how many turns we've played of the game. I guess... I've kind of been going one turn per video, right? So I guess however many videos there are, I think this might be video 30. So I'd say for at least half the game, for at least 15 turns, if not more, maybe 20 turns, she's been the top scorer. And she is like, what is that, like 25 points or so? 10, 20, 30, yeah. 24 points uh, above um, her next competitor, which is Giraffe. Does that mean she's locked up for the for the win? No, it does not. Um, where is she getting her points from? She's getting them primarily from two sources. One from the Pharaonic Egyptians down here, which are a big score. They're starting to crumble though, um, and they're not even a you know they're not even a huge score. They're not. She's not going to be the high scorer anymore. The Romans have come in and. Um, are scoring, I think they scored like 10 points next, last turn, and they can they can even st start scoring more. So there's even more spaces available. Um, Giraffe's really starting to nip at her heels, despite this huge point differential. She's chipping away with the Sudanese. Um, Sudanese aren't looking very strong, though. Uh, the culture cards that the, the Pharaonic Egyptians had make it a lot harder for a new empire to come and take their space. So even like one guy like this gets a substantial... He gets like a plus three, three dice. So he he's four dice instead of one, uh, because of the science advantage. So she has the Pharaonic Egyptians there. She's starting to spread out here. Unfortunately, these Aztecs are not a very high scoring people. Um, they really are reliant on having cities in order to score cities and money, and she just they just don't don't have enough land. Uh, enough plains areas. If they had, if they'd been able to get these plains, I think that maybe they would have had a better chance. Plains, um, they're worth more money and they let you build faster. So uh, they're they're not doing so good. Her third slot, she's just been using to kind of hammer on people, really just annoy on them. Uh, she had the annoy them. She had the Russians here, which caused some trouble for the Finns. Not much though. And then the Dutch in the Low Countries caused trouble for the Romans. But um, yeah, again, they didn't even do that much. So really, she has the Egyptians. They're starting to falter. Uh, she could probably keep scoring with them for a while, uh, but maybe not as much as they were. Uh, her big scoring has been, well, not her big scoring, but she's she's been consistently scoring well here. And part of that is because of the Pharaonic Egyptians. They have a high leader count and, you know, almost exclusive access to two of these places of power, uh, which are what you need to, where you need to go to go to this colonial labyrinth. So that and a lack of competition has really helped to rent out. An another African empire just hasn't been able to establish itself. All right, so that's where Rent is. Next competitor, which who we've already kind of started to talk about, is Giraffe down there. And Giraffe, who's next? God, Giraffe is, there's a huge gulf between Giraffe and her, her next competitor, Melky. Uh, so it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, about 50 points away. So that's, I mean, yeah, it's it's going to, it, it looks like the game is going to end up between our two remaining women, doesn't it? Um, but we don't know. A lot can happen. We're still just right here. So there's still a couple of ages left. And then when we get here, whoever's left, I haven't, something's going to happen. All right. So giraffe. We already talked about the Romans. Romans are doing great in terms of points. They've always kind of felt kind of disheveled, and part of that might just be how cramped Europe is uh, spatially. So there's all these counters, and it's just kind of a mess. It's kind of hard for me to think about that area. Um, who does she have to deal with as the Romans? Not really anyone right now. Which, what uh, Giraffe is going to have to worry about if, if she's even thinking about it, which I don't think she probably is, is new empires because it's Europe and there's going to be a lot of modern empires coming in. Uh, like we see the French right here. There's a modern empire. If someone played the French, they would pop up right here and that could cause some trouble. And the Romans, despite they have, they have a lot of shields, they don't have any science, so they're not going to get any flat out died benefits in terms of combat. They are good traders though 
because of those yellow cards. Um, so yeah, that's the situation with there. Uh, who else does she have? She's kind of using a hammer down here with the, the Sudanese, and like I said, they're not super effective. They have well, they've been effective, but not super effective. It's it's going to take it's going to be kind of a labor in order to chip away at um, the pharaonic Egyptians. I hear my son singing upstairs. He's supposed to be asleep. Uh, maybe singing himself to sleep. And then we finally for draft we had the Spanish who have they they scored. I think spent a lot of time just getting them to score a little bit, and then they've just been sitting here and not done done a lot right now she and just like last turn she's having them just draw more cards for her. so a couple of weak empires one strong empire kind of a similar similar scene as runt let's go down to milky here's where it gets kind of tight with milky cowboy and flush these are the people who are kind of fighting for their lives struggling uh trying to keep from being eliminated I mean, Melky's, I don't think either of them are going to be eliminated soon because Cowboy's almost here. Um, but Flush is starting to score more. But let's let's do a person at a time. So Melky's main main empire is the English here. Um, they're actually doing pretty well now. They, they're getting some money under their belt. They're getting a good, like, extra, that means outside of European presence going. That'll, that'll keep them scoring well. Um, they do have their disorder issue to deal with. So if he can deal with that and kind of keep himself relatively safe from the, the denizens of the New World, I think that will help Milky. He's still kind of got this albatross of the fins. He doesn't want to get rid of that black counter set, um, but it might almost be better if he did, just because they are not scoring any points for him any longer once they've once they lost the dominance in Europe. And they, they could get get dominance again, um, probably, or it's possibly possible. It's possibly possible, but it's a lot of work just for a point, right? You're just gonna get a point out of that. And if they got dom you know, the most land areas in the world, then they would get another point, but then he's gotta compete with the Pharaonic Egyptians for that. So, tough case for the Finns. Um, Melky is going to be starting a new empire. We'll have to see what that is this this turn. Um, so what's he worrying about? He's worrying about Cowboy right there. Cowboy's going to be nipping at his heels soon. And he's worrying about eventually overtaking Giraffe or Runt, but probably Giraffe because if he doesn't, by the time it gets here, it doesn't matter if he beats back Cowboy or Flush because he's going to be out of the game. So he's, he's in a tough position. Um... He's kind of got to fight the people off at his heels while getting up there uh, so that he can eventually be in the, the end game, whatever that's going to be. So that's Milky. Uh, going back down to Cowboy. Cowboy is very close to Milky. Cowboy has a big, fat, culturally powerful empire in the Phoenicians. Uh, another case where this is a little different of a case from the Pharaonic Egyptians and the Romans in that the Phoenicians aren't high scorers. So they're, they're kind of more akin to... The Finns, except they have a much higher cultural stack, probably the best, it will definitely the best cultural stack. He's, I think he's got the strongest amount of, the most amount of wreaths, the most amount of science, probably the most amount of military. So going toe to toe, he can take anyone, but he really hasn't done a lot with them. He uses them for civilized actions, um, and that's going to be his plan this turn. That's about it. Then he has his Plains Americans. They were his big scorers, actually. So he had his, his actual powerful empire and then his empire that was scoring. Uh, they are kind of sandwiched between a lot of trouble right now. So uh, we have Runt's Aztecs here. We have a couple of Portuguese here. And then we have the English coming in. And really, they just they have to have the most people in America or else they're kind of worthless to Cowboy. Though I guess, you know, with all these higher level empires, and let's see, where are they at? Yeah, they're only here on the progress track. So anytime they beat someone, and I forgot to do this actually, they should be getting points. I think he beat Portuguese twice last turn, right? So Cowboy should have two more points. There we go. Um, so there's that too. And I, I could see Cowboy running with that ball, but they're not military that militarily that powerful. Um, and then finally we have Flush. Flush is on his way out, I'm pretty sure, despite an impressive empire in the Japanese. I mean, the Japanese kind of have the best of a lot of worlds. They have a, they're a very good empire, if you look at them. Um, and they score on all kinds of things. They, um, they create cities like nobody's business, 
or like it's their business. And um, there's no one over here. So <laughs> they have everything. If, if Flush had a little bit more time, I feel like he could really do quite well with them. Though, of course, if that were the case, I think the, the Japanese would be hammered down by someone because even if no one's nearby, they can always use their their culture wreaths to throw down cards, you know, blow up some volcanoes here, whatever. Um, but still, it's it's a shame. Uh, what else does Flush have going for me? Is the Portuguese? Portuguese got a good start with their kind of new world sneak attack, um, but that's since been beaten back, and I can't really foresee them being able to um, make that work. If they had if they had kept the Plains Americans in check. Um, Flush is going to start building some boats because they also score on on having waterways in the world. And if they they were their only naval power over here, they probably could have expanded quite a bit without having to uh, compete with anyone for that. But again, he needs time for that. And finally, Flush has his Siamese. They're really safe here, but they can only score two points unless they get ahead on the progress track or unless they get a bunch of money. But in that case, they're competing with the Japanese who already have a lot of money. So it's, it's kind of a wash there. And that's where everyone's looking. Melky has revealed his new empire. He's the, the turn starter uh, this turn. And it is the Ottomans, complete with Suleiman right here. Uh, of the Neil Diamond song. Um, that's gonna be a huge problem, I think, for Cowboy if he wants to hold on to his Phoenicians. So. Let's let's take a look at what these uh, Ottomans can do. One, they they start out fairly fairly advanced, only three away from the leader, which is the uh, which is the Phoenicians. There, two horse horses and mounted units are only two dollars or half price when you first start them. And actually, since they start with an administrator, shoot, gosh, I gotta I gotta read distribute units. So they start with an administrator, they're even cheaper. Everything's only going to cost, they're only going to cost one for horses, and all these missile units are going to cost two. And then they're also going to get a free maneuver. So they're going to go there, and he's going to probably wipe out a good chunk of the Phoenicians, uh, depending on how the dice roll out. But um, I, I got to figure out the new money since Suleiman's an administrator. He's really good. He's an administrator, a builder, and a strategist. Wow. All right, here you see the spread. Uh, we actually had a fight already at Armenia. I'm not going to show you the rollouts on these. I'm just going to, I think I'll check back in and just let you the results, know the results of each one. So Armenia was a close fight. Um, the Ottomans did win. Uh, Belki did something different than people normally do. Normally with the uh, Victory dice. So here's his victory dice. Here's flushes. Normally, they you can get rid of the opponent's victory dice by on a one for one basis if you want. He decided to just let. Uh, cow uh, sorry, I said flush. I always I always mix up cowboy and flush's names. I've done that for the longest time. I don't know why. Um, it's not like I forget who's who. It's just they they're they sound similar to me in my head for, in a weird way, not exactly that, but I don't know how to explain it. Anyway, he let um, Cowboy keep all three of his dice so that he could use six dice to steal this card right here, um, trying to get a, uh, slowly get some scientific advantage over Cowboy as the, the series of confrontations goes on. So that was the first one. Um, so Cowboy was able to use the three dice that he had to get rid of the three units that uh, Milky invaded with. It should be interesting how this all plays out. Let's do the next one. Um, hmm, where else? Where does he want to go next? I think he wants to go here next. All right, so we finished the fight in Syria and in Asia Minor. So Syria ended up, um, it was the capital, uh, ended up, Milky took out Cowboy's units there and I think, and just his dice. So there's one unit there. Um, Despite Melky's like huge unit advantage, Cowboy Science advantage has made it so that he's been competitive in all of these fights. Slightly less um, dice than Melky in every single one, and so we're seeing that Melky has a little bit of an upper hand, but not quite totally dominating. Asia Minor, um, he did the same move where he just took a card instead of getting rid of Cowboy's dice. That uh, that allowed Cowboy to get rid of more of Melky's units. Um, Milky's units are relatively cheap though, so maybe he can buy them back. Um, 
but not getting rid of Cowboy's units meant that Cowboy's unit got to go here and reinforce in this next battle. So we'll see how that, that shapes the, the conflicts to come. And in Assyria, Milky decided to just trash the observatory. Uh, it had to do with how the dice came down. So he had four uh, victory dice to Cowboy's two there. Um, he didn't want to, he could have stolen I, I think a science card, but then that would have given Cowboy his full two dice to do something. He wouldn't be able to hang on to Assyria. So what he did was he um, used three dice, I think, to get rid of the observatory. And that actually, that that now they're scientifically um, even, at least in terms of fights. So they tie in two areas, and then, no, I think what it is is he he leads in one area. He leads in another area, and they tie in the third. I think that's what that did. Yeah, so currently he has, well, he can decide what this one is, but he has one one wheel and say it's a, a tablet, right? Now, if we look at Cowboy, Cowboy has more of these now, or he has, um, oh, sorry, I keep, I'm, I'm aiming high again, I apologize. Uh, he has more of these, so that gives him one point. Uh, he doesn't have any gears though, so Melky gets a point on that, and then they tie on the tablet, so long as Melky makes that a tablet. So in this last fight, Cowboy only had a had the lead of one die due to science, now they're going to be tied. And with a rather shaky taking of Mesopotamia, Melky has now turned the military science advantage to his benefit. He has a one point benefit on Cowboy. However, he's done that at the cost of a lot of units. He started off with a ton of units, right? Um, his Suleiman, coupled with the Ottomans uh, starting piggy bank and some discounts they had allowed him to have a huge stack. Uh, he, he sacrificed a lot of those just to get this scientific advantage that he feels will help him in the long run. Um, and at the same time, a lot of Cowboys units have gotten away. So like these two here were defending Mesopotamia, they're now there, and they, they can potentially do a, a counterattack, although they'll have to cross the river to do so. Um, so now we have our final battle, which is where Suleiman himself is going into Thrace across the water. That's going to be a benefit to Cowboy, um, but we'll see. Oh, and there's a retreating unit as well. All right, pretty, pretty cake combat. Um, they were easily defeated. The crossing benefit for Cowboy wasn't enough to save them. Um, since since Suleiman is so awesome and he's a strategist, he gets to go again, and he's going to do so. There, uh, Melky's going pressing right into Rome <laughs> with the Ottomans here. Um, there's there's a very good reason to do that. One is uh, or the main one. Well, two actually, two good reasons. One is drafts his his opponent too. He would really like to overcake overtake draft as, while he's pushing cowboy down uh, catapulting off of his head as he presses him into the water um, and also the Ottomans they get to they get they get to put out free free fellows with rifles or other infantry but probably the riflemen would be the best um, every time they take a area from a Christian Empire and the Romans are Christians now so gonna be a pretty easy fight for him to beat Giraffe unless she has some cards. Cowboy was unlucky. That, that could have all gone very differently if Cowboy had some cards to help him because he did have the shield advantage. The Romans also have the shield advantage and so we have to see if uh, Giraffe has anything up her sleeve. Nope, she had nothing. Melky is a lucky fellow. He also got rid of her pawn shop. And despite her recent point-wise riches, it's not a good turn to be Giraffe here. Um, not only did Melky's Ottomans just start up and they are incentivized to attack the Romans, but Runt has also just started the Papal State. Now the Papal State, they're going to convert, um, which means they're just going to just be on her side instead, convert Romans to Papal State units. And I believe Rome is the capital here. Yep. And so that's going to get rid of all of, uh, all of giraffes Romans money and just cause her all kinds of problems so she suddenly the Romans have to deal with the Ottomans coming in here recruiting units uh, from their uh, uh, with their blood and then she's also going to have to deal with Romans right here uh, coming in and taking Rome away and after that abnormally long start empire phase we had a 
fairly interesting production phase and a, and a really short trade in progress phase. The only trade happened between the Pharaonic Egyptians and their new foes, the Sudanese, um, which was def the, the trade ended up in the Egyptians' favor by quite a bit. Um, they got a theater out of it. Anyway, so production, what, what was interesting about that? Well, main thing was that the Finns are building up. That uh, giraffe has now found herself surrounded by Melky. Uh, her main her main Romans um, are in a, in a bit of trouble. Their only way out, well, I guess they don't have to run away. <laughs> Never mind, I'm not even going to talk about their way out. It's not like they're monsters. But um, it's going to be, you know, she's got to, she, yes, yeah, suddenly she's in some very hot water. The fins were kind of languishing. Now they're starting to build up. They're not, you know, it's going to take them a little bit to, to actually be able to, penetrate but if she also has the ottomans coming in and then the english over here uh her big scores could be in trouble so that was one piece of the production and that was the most interesting part the the sudanese built up um the uh what are they called the siamese they just got some money basically uh flush is trying to get some, uh, become the first and second uh, money score and that's that's going on all right so now we're going to have actually maneuver phase we did a, we did a lot of maneuvering in our start empire phase but now we need to maneuver during the maneuver phase and the maneuver phase was quick um, it was pretty much just the Romans and not pretty much it was just the Rom Romans and the Portuguese during that I, I remembered <laughs> so I, I was just talking about the the hot water giraffes uh, Romans are finding themselves in. I remembered uh, the papal state here. Sorry, in between filmings, there's been a lot going on, so I keep forgetting what's going on. Um, right now, my son just woke up too, so I gotta, I gotta be going soon. That start empire phase <laughs> really took up a, a good chunk of my time. A lot of dice rolling and whatnot. Anyway, so yeah, Romans were were set to maneuver just to kind of try and fill out some of these wheat areas and score more, like I talked about at the beginning of the video. Uh, but really, Giraffe found that she couldn't move around too much. She lost some units, some of her doubled up units, um, like uh, in Rome here. And she's, she was just kind of spread out. Um, and she needs to keep her borders secure from all these problems. So not a very good maneuver phase for her. And then the Portuguese, they didn't do much either. They, they did take out um, a Plains American here in Oregon, uh, which this is probably where I am up here. Um, and then they just started to pull a Spanish, a Spaniard, and start spreading down this way, moving towards Africa to hope, hopefully, maybe get some points that way. I think Flush just didn't really know what to do with his secondary empires, the Siamese and the Portuguese. They're both kind of weak, and time's running out. So this seven ages, seven by seven ages game is always kind of mirrored to me, uh, in some ways, the game that preceded it, which was. Uh, origins, how we became human. Pablo Origins, how we became human. It was a play-by-form game that involved these same same characters, these same real people. Um, for those of you who didn't watch that, there was a portion in it where I went on vacation and I brought the real people with me. And one of them didn't make it back. She was missing. Uh, and her name was Pegasus. That's why, that's, all, that's part of the reason why it was especially exciting for me. Um, that in the middle of this this particular turn, I my you know the turn went longer than usual because of the start empires and maybe I'm just moving slower because it's winter time. And my son went got up and so I told him we were going to go shopping after he woke up and he woke up and said let's go shopping because he really loves to go shopping. Um, and so that's why it was so exciting for me to find this at Goodwill. Real people. This is the game, and I think the video I made of real people. I didn't actually have this box because I had done away with it. Look at the back. You can see there's Mooney's Aqualad right there. Boom, on the back of the thing. So let's. Oh my gosh! And there, I didn't even see this before, but there is Pegasus, right there. So this is special. So if I can find her in here, you know she's going to have to join the game. I don't know where she will be in the point track, because it wouldn't really be fair for her to be so far below everyone, but it wouldn't be fair for her to be so far in front either. It would be in last place, equal with whoever's at the, at the back. 
and just have to go from there. But then she needs some setup time too. I don't know. So do like a little mini unboxing. Here are the rules to real people. I spent a while. Um, you know, when I played this game, I first saw real people. I didn't think much of it. It wasn't until later that I came up with ideas on other things to do with the cards. Um, I mean, yeah. Wow. So, I've seen a lot of familiar faces, but I'm also seeing a lot of um, faces that I don't recognize. Those of you who don't know, I... Um, got rid of a lot of my real people cards. Not a lot of them, but some. I didn't really get rid of. I gave them away to other people. Wow, this person really played this game. Lots of um, score sheets here. Here's the rack. So, if I remember correctly, and I like, put the cards in here, and then you say, like, it would be like, this person's nickname is Pete the Cheat, um, or something like that, and then they'd have to guess which one is the real person that's beat the cheat. Turns out it's this one. So you'd have all four up there and they'd have to choose between those four. So let's see if we can find her. We lost her in the summertime. Let's see if we can find her in the winter. And you can just watch me look through all of these cards. It'd be better actually if you could see the cards as I look through them. That'd probably be more interesting to you. Let's do a quick camera angle change here. Showing you my director skills. Wow. I look through every single card. Now this stack feels smaller than I expected. Oh. I like this guy. This guy always stands out to me. Um, oh, you know who that is? One of our champions. You really want me to find Pegasus. Hey, we know him. Oh. This, guy's, this guy, I, I've role played with a guy who looks a lot like him. Um, there's Pinky. He, him, I think he was in the, my instructional video. He's a priest, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. He's kind of a piercing priest size. Hey. Twigmar. Where's that Coonies? I always get their names confused. That's Coonies. Uh, hey! Come on, Pegasus, be in here. Yep. Hey! I'm playing Crusoe's Planet with him right now and some other people. Well, not right now, but I have the game set up. Fries is in that game too. Trying out a new, um, she's ravishing. Um, I'm trying out a new kind of rules adjustment I'm making to Crusoe's Planet, where all the different people have um, one of three particular hobbies or interests um, that are randomly assigned, and you can only really trade with people who have the same interest as you without paying some some leisure penalty. Some of you might miss him. That was Tony's guy. Um, so like golfing, for example. Hey, there's Jabber. Um, I, think, I think my three activities are golfing, long walks, and whale watching. So those are the activities that people do business over. Right? Hey. Hey! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Sue Cowboys. Can you, am I getting the angle right? No. No. Can you see it? I think the chair's in the way. Um, rock chair. This is great television. Can you see the other cowboy? Yeah. I can't really see the, the screen. Anyway, two cowboys. It's it's weird to see two in the same place. Like, you know, I know that her card is somewhere nearby, but it's to see a cowboy here and then just look over and there's cowboy there. I. It's kind of like if you were to, you know, be hanging out with your friend. Hey! And then um, 
you would look across the street and there was your friend. She's playing that game too. Um, Crusoe's Planet. There's a lot of people in here I would love to play with. I've, play, I've, I've done something with this guy, but he wasn't in the real people multi-game solitary mega tournament. I, maybe I role-played with him. Hey, Sunny. Sunny's fun to play Crusoe's Planet with. Hey, hey, she got, she got eliminated. Um, cast and cat. Oh, this guy. Now he, he was in something too. Gosh, this guy's good. He was in a role-playing game. I remember. He was an android. She was in a number of things. Whoa. So I don't know what I'm gonna do with all these real people cards. Hey, sweet pea. This guy, he, turtle. I can't remember if he's in the real people or not, but I feel like he was. Could have just been in the game I played by myself. Hey! This is the best episode of the real people multi-game solitary mega Hey! Ever. Because it's going to be the most drawn out, maybe not the longest, hey, um, but definitely the most drawn out, hey, and it has the most real people cards. You probably don't even need to watch any other, hey, ha, two flushes, um, real people, multi and solitary mega tournament at all ever again because you can just see, you're going to see all the cards right now. If I had my camera angle right, I'm not really paying too much attention. God, oh, yeah. Oh, this guy's fun. Um, uh, hey, he's playing Crucible Planet. Or he might have. Oh, this guy is a total dick. Um, she's familiar. Gosh, what? Was she in a. Oh, Little Red. This is what I would have looked like as a female. Oh, sorry, as a female, if in at that time maybe if I was well, maybe if I was a little younger because this is 1990s, right? Yeah, yeah. No, if I'm a little older, I mean. Uh, she was in the. I, she was the wizard when I played dungeon, on, for the dungeon review. I think that's what she is. Um, one of the two wizards. Hey, there's Runt. Dicky. See, there's some guys from the like Imperial 2030 game, which was the first game, I think. Hey, DJ Double J. Uh, Snugbug. The first game for the real people multi game solitary mega tournament that I can't really remember so well. Red Tomato. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah, I think this guy, he's really casual. I don't think I have that card anymore. See, I think some sometimes I sent cards that I thought were interesting, and sometimes I sent away cards that um, just randomly. So, oh, here she is right on the top. So we're not going to look through them all. We're going to stop right here. We found Pegasus. She's back with us. Wow. I, I'm just going to read about her to you right now just because she's back. And that's just a nice way to say hello. This is what I remember about you. And it's written on the back of your head. Name's Pegasus. You're a house engineer. Your secret fantasy is to sail around the Pacific with Mel Gibson. You hate coffee. You also don't like procrastination. You'd like to meet Tom Clancy. Your personal motto is do it now. And I think Little Red had a similar motto. You're most proud of your ability to survive. That is true. I thought she was gone. I thought she was toast. And I still can't, couldn't tell you what happened to her. I don't, I think she's probably hidden somewhere amongst my things. I think she's got to be. Um, but you were, she was kind of gone to me, dead to me, and now here she is. She wasn't dead. Her ability to survive. Uh, her reputation in high school is a joker. Uh, three words that describe her are friendly, curious, humorous. All right, I don't know, I, I don't think I can jump her in right now because we're in the middle of a turn. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish this up and then next time I'll see how I can work her back in. Welcome back, Pegasus.
Go ahead, you guys can say it too. Welcome back, Pegasus. The English are delving into their destiny and have found themselves favored by the gods. What that means is that normally in destiny you discard cards and then you draw cards. Um, in this case, Milky's English are able to play cards and then draw cards instead. I mean, they can discard as well. So he discarded a card, and then he's also going to be, he tried to play Pestilence on um, the Plains Americans. It did not work. Um, and then he got rid of all of the, the Aztecs' money. They had, I think, 44 bucks, which is the second most. That's going to put his English at having the, no, not his English, at having the second most. His, uh, these guys having the second most, the Ottomans, but the Ottomans don't score in money. Anyway, he got he got them out of the way. Anyway, uh, he had the cards. It's better, you know, if you're going to be drawing cards, you play the cards, play them. And then he also, and here's the big one, he got rid of all the disorder using karma. So he has the favor of the gods and some other karma saved up or whatever uh, that got rid of all the disorder in the English Empire. If you recall, I said that was one of the biggest problems the English had is that they were so disordered um, and it would have been hard for them to get rid of that uh, because they would have needed to produce more units and it's harder to produce more units because you don't get money from disordered areas. So pretty nice for Melky. The real cowboy just made a big move and not one that I'm sure I, I, I think would make sense in a standard game of seven ages but in seven by seven ages uh, there's a there's a, an incentive in certain situations um, with the player elimination to do moves that hurt someone more than it necessarily helps you. This is this isn't necessarily going to hurt Cowboy, but it's not going to help him as much as the as an alternative. And maybe I should explain what I'm talking about. So everyone can start three empires, which I'm realizing is going to be a barrier to bring Pegasus back in. Um, but everyone can start three empires. And normally you want to start a fresh empire because, you know, you get it, you get it all to yourself. Here, um, I should just tell you what he did. He ca causes a, a civil war in England. So if you look at England, it's broken up between orange and blue. England's essentially two empires with one card, right? And the blue pieces are controlled by cowboy and will be scored separately for cowboy and the orange pieces are um, milkies so that that's that's a big shift that's going to change things in a lot of ways it's going to change scoring for boats it's going to change scoring uh, for the new world um, that may also that means there's another empire that wants to uh, colonize outside of Europe so we have the Portuguese the Spanish and then two two bodies of the English who want to do that and there's a there's a there's a lot that's shifted in this one turn of the game so I really don't know how scoring and progressing and all that's gonna go it's all gonna be different all gonna be different the final bit of our civilized action and the final move of the turn other than discarding empires I guess goes to flush his Japanese caused storms that wiped out both English factions in in the Pharaohs, the North Sea, and the Bay of Biscay. That, that hurt Cowboy more than uh, Milky, but didn't do a ton of damage. They just lost some boats, right? Um, what else? Oh, he, he promoted a couple leaders. He got he had ambitious leaders, so he was able to get two. That's going to maybe maybe pay off for him. He's got a lot of these areas here where you can adventure, so if he can get those leaders in, start maneuvering with his Japanese, and start scoring on the... Um, the labyrinth he might actually have a shot the damage Melky did to to cowboy which i really wasn't expecting till today when it started happening um could have changed things quite a bit though cowboy of course could just have the phoenicians make a trade <laughs> really i mean why wouldn't he right let's take a i'm gonna figure out how everyone's doing in point wise all right, definitely a different situation so runts pharaonic egyptians are scientific masters right now um, they got the free advance. Yeah, they are. It's actually kind of been working out for them not to be advanced because it lets them keep all their old artifacts and score points off of that. But, oh well. Um, how did everything else break down? Well, Melky had got two per, per group. The early Finns have the most in Europe again. Um, so they are now scoring. The Ottomans got two 
from their homeland and the second most in Asia. And then the English, they, they have the most outside of Europe now, um, but they uh, lose a point for not having England. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, this switcheroo with the blue and the orange, right? Because remember, the Scottish were the blue in Scotland, and then England went and stomped on them. And now there's this civil war, and now the blue is down in England. So he got the treasury, and uh, cowboy did, and um, he has England. Now, Scotland has a big stack of units, so that's, so that's going to be a problem for Cowboy. Uh, you notice this big absence here. The Aztecs, they vacated the premises. They have been discarded and are out of the game, which is too bad for Runt. She actually would have scored off of them for having the majority in the Americas that turn. Um, but she didn't know that, and she's got better things to do, I think, or she thinks. Um, so two apiece for, for Milky. Cowboy scored not too bad off the English, actually. So he had the homeland. He had the second most ex external to Europe. Yes. Yeah. He was actually tied with the Portuguese. But because he went first in the turn order, he got the second most. So that was two points there. Three. And then that was it. Three points. So that's not so bad, though. Three bonus points. Two there. And then he, he used a card that doubled the amount of amount of points the Plains Americans got, so he got four off of that. So not a bad scoring round for Cowboy. Um, you can see he's still ten ahead of Flush, and we're you know all he has to do is trade or do something else. Um, I could see him getting involved in in conflagrations and whatnot. Uh, giraffe front still scoring good. Flush is still scoring good, but like I said, I don't think it's going to be fast enough. I've been thinking I don't know how I'm going to bring Pegasus in because there's no armies for her to use. Um, I think what I'll do is from now on, well, it's kind of unfair because she made the, these choice. I think Runt gets a, gets a color of army. Okay, but then from now on, as armies get gone, the first two colors, that, the first color, eh, I'll, I'll come up with something. Next time, on uh, the Real People Multi-Game Solitary Mega Tournament, 7x7 seven seven Ages.